Thanks, everybody, for the opportunity to talk today about spotted lanternfly. Uh, it's certainly become a high priority for DEC in recent months. I remember sitting at several council meetings last year and hearing Chris Logue from Ag and Marcus warn us about spotted lanternfly and how you know, we should all be paying attention to this one. And then last fall, a dead spotted lanternfly was found in Delaware County in New York. And I think that really prompted uh, DEC's involvement and um, to make this species a, a high priority. Well, there's a scientific name. I'll just go over some, some background information first. Lycorma delicatula. Um, a lot of times I'll refer to it as SLF, just a heads up. Um, it's native to China and southeastern Asia and was likely transported to the United States on a shipment of stone. I think that's the general theory. And was discovered in Pennsylvania in 2014. Since then, it's been found in various stages in a few other states besides New York, uh, Virginia, Delaware, and New Jersey. But so far, the major uh, infestation and worry is, is coming out of Pennsylvania. A couple things to note, this, this bug feeds on a whopping 70 species of plants. You can go on the internet, there's lots of lists that um, demonstrate the range of, of host plants. A few of them are listed on the slide, grapes, apple tops, maples, um, but most important is that the life cycle of this insect is inextricably tied to tree of heaven, Elanthus altissima. And I'm not sure we fully understand how or why the, the insect is, is drawn to tree of heaven at, at some point in its life cycle, but it is important to note that tree of heaven is also an invasive species in New York. So a little bit on the identification. This picture on the upper left is the image we're used to seeing for spotted lanternfly because it's so flashy. It's so remarkable. Um, it's very unique looking. Um, so while I think a lot of our outreach products use that image to get people's attention, the picture on the top right is actually the way most people would probably see the adult form um, with the swing closed in the resting in the resting stage. So we're trying to keep that in mind with our with our outreach products as we talk to people that, you know, one photo can be used to really grab people's attention, but that both the other phases, uh, the other stages of the life cycle, as well as the really unique behaviors of this insect are should also be used to help people identify it and, and learn about its impacts. Uh, that picture on the bottom right show some of this really distinctive swarming behavior and feeding behavior. I'll get into that a little bit more in the presentation, but um, there's a lot of unique uh, things to, to notice about the, about the morphology of, of spotted lanternfly. A couple more details for identification. Um, I'll get into the life cycle a little bit more, but on the top right, you'll see the, the first three instars uh, look like this. They're black with a white dot. The last instar is a little bit larger and it's got this red color. Um, and of course, the larger adults um, shown in the other two images. As we've incorporated uh, images and, you know, things for people to search for for spotted lanternfly, uh, we have gotten some reports from the public. Uh, most of, all of them have been misidentified, but there are several things that, you know, now that we're looking at the slides, they may not appear to look like spotted lanternfly, but there are several moth species and other insect species that to the untrained eye could look like spotted lanternfly. These are a few I think um, Jeff Cancellari of the lab has gotten reports of. So it's just something to be aware of. I, I don't actually know what these insects are. But um, yeah, it's worth noting that we have other things in New York that could potentially be confused with spotted lanternfly. Here's a little bit more on the life cycle. Um, this slide always confuses me because it's going counterclockwise, but the adults can be seen as early as July, which is soon. So, um, you know, we'll be encouraging people to look for 
for the adult form. Um, and then on the left, as you go through the cycle, you see um, the egg masses, and I have some better pictures of that uh, later on, but again, the mention of Tree of Heaven and how often eggs are laid on Tree of Heaven, but really could be laid on any, any smooth surface. And again, the nymphs hatch in late April to early May, and that last instar with the red on it um, later on. All right, I want to spend some time talking about those egg masses because I think it's part of the life cycle that we've been focusing on a lot because of the way they could be so easily transported. Um, so here's some images across the bottom that show uh, what it could look like in, in different, um, different stages. Each egg mass contains somewhere between 30 and 50 eggs and can be laid on all sorts of materials, uh, vehicles, stone, firewood, um, yard furniture, um, all kinds of anything smooth, anything. Yes. Um, uh, just, a, just a warning to yeah. those on the phone to mute your line. Um, okay, back to it. Um, <laughs> the image on the lower right shows uncovered um, egg masses from previous years. In the middle photo shows how they can be laid kind of inconspicuously on what looks like a picnic table or something like that. And on the left, uh, just another image of, of what these egg masses look like. And I did read recently that um, adults can lay these eggs in as little as 30 minutes. So that's all um, information we've been keeping in mind as we talk about early detection and prevention. Um, as part of uh, the New York State considerations for spotted lanternfly. Here's one more picture of the egg masses just because it shows really good, um, an, a good image for scale with the uncovered egg mass shown on the right, the adult, and the, the covered egg mass. So we're trying to keep these images in circulation so that people know what to look for and would know to report something like this. Um, but again, it's worth noting that other insects lay similar looking eggs. Here's just a, a few examples. So we do expect to have people reporting things that aren't in fact uh, spotted lanternfly egg masses. All right, let's get to the good stuff. Um, the impacts, uh, I think we're still really learning about what the impacts of spotted lanternfly can really become. We know that the feeding stresses plants and makes them vulnerable to many other things, including disease and other insects. Um, the large amount of honeydew or, or excrement that these, these bugs produce has its own set of impacts, which attracts molds and interferes with photosynthesis, which in turn negatively affects the growth and yield of plants. If you look at any of the news from Pennsylvania and you see they'll have new segments out in a vineyard, um, the, the impacts of these to the, to the vines, especially the grape vines, is staggering. You'll see entire fields of, of grapes that are just completely devastated. Um, and lastly there, uh, significantly hinder outdoor activities, which is probably a little bit of an understatement. Um, the honeydew that's secreted by spotted lanternfly is it's a quality of life issue as well. Um, we have reports from Pennsylvania of people hanging out in their backyards and being covered with this sticky, uh, sticky, gooey mess um, from, especially in the quarantine area where these populations are really dense. So, you know, outdoor activities are getting canceled, restaurants aren't serving outside. Um, these are the kinds of things we're, we're really trying to prevent uh, from happening in New York. Um, so here's a, a few more pictures of what the, um, what the impacts can look like 
while they're happening, the oozing and weeping from the tiny wounds of the trees, especially when they feed in mass like this. Um, it, as it says on the slide, it appears wet and may give off fermented odors. And that honeydew, honeydew that they secrete while they're feeding, it's pretty gross looking, as you can tell, and uh, often develops sooty mold. So back to Pennsylvania, this map shows the survey results from last fall. As you can see, the large amount of the positive detections are in southeast Pennsylvania. This is also where they've instituted a 13 county quarantine zone um, to prevent bottle lanternfly from leaving these areas. There's compliance agreements and uh, inspections that they're really trying to get people to adhere to, different industry, industries to adhere to. Um, so I think at this point, that was this map was from last fall. We could see this change a lot with surveys from, from this year, especially given that we know it's been found in other states. This map just gives another perspective. So the 13 counties of the quarantine in Pennsylvania are highlighted in green. And the red and blue lines show just a distance buffer to give you an idea of regionally where New York and the other states fall within um, proximity to the quarantine zone. Not very far when you really think about it. All right, so that's some of the background information that's gone into the considerations for New York's effort to um, detect and prevent spotted lanternfly. And I'll get into some of the details about what we've been working on the past few months. Back in January, I think the first, the first real effort was to implement the incident command system. Um, we've been working with partners at Ag and Market and APHIS, USDA APHIS, to create a joint effort to plan for spotted lantern fly. Because at this point, it's probably more of a when than if situation. And the idea was to leverage the, the resources, the expertise, the staff um, to, to generate a unified command where we could um, you know, come up with the, with the best ideas we could. And the incident command system we've used for a few of our other projects, including Oakville and Spotted Lanternfly, or excuse me, Southern Pine Beetle. It's, it's worked out well, I think, uh, even though it was developed more for uh, natural disaster type situations, but it also lends itself well to um, natural resource management. So the idea here being uh, once you're assigned a position in the ICS, you only have to worry about the roles that are already designated to that title. Um, so you can see we've got several staff from the three different agencies outlined here. And um, it's supposed to um, keep processes in place so that nothing's missed and that everything's considered, communication is constant, and um, there's no redundancy in effort. So I think so far it's worked out really well, um, especially um, I want to draw your attention to the middle box on the bottom. Um, Carrie Brown Lima has been serving as a liaison between our group and the science advisory panel. Um, she's brought in some expertise from the Forest Service and Penn State and even two researchers from Korea, which is wonderful. Um, so it's so nice to have um, Carrie as a part of this to, to um, make sure our decisions are well informed. All right, so Jason Denham, who's here in the room with me, um, has come up with a survey plan, at least a draft survey plan, that has six components that I'll just talk about briefly. Um, survey is one of our big emphasis this, this spring and summer, along with education and outreach, outreach. The map shown on this slide was developed by Brent Kinel in our office. 
to show the areas of the state that would be most at risk for spotted lanternfly. He used a number of um, number of criteria to develop this sort of heat map. Um, a lot of it had to do with the Tree of Heaven distribution as well as transportation corridors, knowing that um, the way the egg masses are laid on rail cars or vehicles or trucks, that um, that would be a huge, a huge risk to areas of New York that have a lot of transportation corridors. So, and along with the proximity to the known infestations in Pennsylvania, it's not surprising that Long Island, Lower Hudson, and the Crisp region really light up. Those are the areas where we hope to focus um, a lot of the survey. So the objectives are outlined here on the slide. Um, prioritize areas for spotted lantern flag based on known occurrence and the potential hazard using the information that Brent put together. Number two, establish baseline distributions and densities of tree of heaven, which is really just a ground survey to verify the information that we have digitally. Number three, conduct visual detection surveys for all the stages of the spotted lantern fly and also present absence data for Tree of Heaven. We're using a number of um, platforms to, to capture that information, including Survey123 forms, um, IMAP invasives, and the like. A number four is conduct delimitation surveys as needed around any confirmed spotted lantern fly detections. I'll talk about that a little bit more later, um, but it is part of our survey plan. The last couple objectives, number five, deploy sticky band traps in highly visible, high risk tree of heaven stands. Um, the idea there being to intercept uh, any populations that are existing, but also as an education tool to um, um, alert people that DEC and partners are, are out there. And um, Emma Antolos, who's running our education and outreach um, program, she has come up with some tree tags that would hopefully be um, installed with the with the sticky band traps. Um, the picture on the right shows, it may be a little bit hard to tell, but those are all the nymph stages that are captured on these sticky band traps that are wrapped around the tree as shown in the bottom photo. So the, the nymphs have this behavior of climbing um, host plants and falling down. And so this, the sticky band traps really exploit that behavior by capturing them on, on these sticky band traps. And I think you heard on the updates, several of our partners um, talking about um, how they are gonna help us install these and monitor these throughout the state. Last objective, evaluate the efficacy of various survey methods in New York and revise the plan as needed. All right, so regulatory plan was developed by Ag and Marcus. Um, they really have a lot of authority in law that allows them to conduct many of these inspections as part of their regular, regular jobs. Um, so I've listed here some of the focus of those inspections. Um, staff has been trained and made aware of spotted lanternfly and what to look for. So their horticultural inspect inspectors are going to be out, um, you know, in these areas and in these centers looking for spotted lanternfly. But the first bullet there, the New York State DOT checkpoints, is um, has been a focus this spring in which um, we were able to kind of piggyback on those checkpoints where they check for compliance with um, commercial trucking regulations but we were able to also inspect for spotted lanternfly egg masses on commercial vehicles and the cargo that they were carrying. In fact, it was, um, it was a nice partnership because even Rob Cole had the drone out there looking on the tops of the various cargos looking for, uh, looking for a spotted lanternfly. Uh, the last bullet there, there is a draft commissioner order for protective zone establishment. Um, through DEC, similar to what we've done for Oakville or Emerald Ash Borer. Um, and this would really be 
for the management of Tree of Heaven um, as a strategy for controlling spider lantern fly. I realize we are running low on time, so I'm going to zoom through this part. But um, these are this is just the timing of how we plan to implement some of these um, surveys and um, prevention efforts. Um, you'll notice the third part down, campgrounds. That's something we've just been recently trying to consider. You know, how can we, how can we track people that may be coming from Pennsylvania, or how can we, um, you know, inform people that are visiting New York this summer, and, and you know, using that as a way to to reach people about spider lantern fly. Uh, lastly, to outreach. Like I said, Emma Antolis has done an awesome job uh, really leading the, the campaign here. She's created a bunch of things with help from the Lands and Forest staff and, and staff at Ag and Market. Um, we've got several ways to report for spotted lanternflies, tons of materials. Um, she's been working with social media and uh, she worked on a press release and we've got all kinds of good traction in the media, as well as those uh, trap tags that I develop uh, that I mentioned are are still being developed. But another nice component of the outreach plan, um, I saw it's coming up, and there's a bunch of spotted lanternfly um, events as part of that too. Um, but the outreach has really just been a, such a huge focus, knowing that. Um, we can only be in so many places at once and have an informed public that knows what to look for or at least knows when something looks strange and that they know how to report something is, is just a huge, a huge asset when you're working with something like this and you're trying to find it as early as possible. This is just an example of, of some of the traction in the media, most recently in the New York Times. The caption is kind of funny, but also kind of daunting. But I, it's worth noting that um, you know it's more of a, a regional issue as well at this point, not just a New York State or a Pennsylvania issue. Um, you know, a lot of states in in the United States could benefit from our efforts here. Uh, lastly, the you know the response. What what we'll actually try to do when we do find spotted lanternfly. Um, the primary goals are are listed here. Um, delimit the infestation using a grid system. There's uh, a plan to um, implement the one kilometer grids and use the grids to um, to survey and then. Once there's a grid found around the infestation that doesn't have spotted lanternfly, that will be used as the as the line for um, for what the infestation encompasses. Um, secondly, develop a site management plan. There was initially some discussion to create template management plans, but the number of variables that exist right now without having uh, any live spotted lanternfly in New York is is a lot, you know, it depends on what the life stage is, how, how many there are, uh, what, who owns the property, what sort of access we have. So, you know, we haven't spent much time um, developing the management plans, but we still plan to pursue eradication efforts upon detection. Um, hopefully we've got enough in place here and enough um, people uh, involved with the project to be able to move swiftly and aggressively towards eradication efforts. A couple things that aren't on this slide is funding. I think that'll become an issue at, at some point in the future, depending on you know, how spider lanternfly is, is discovered. Uh, and research is the other thing that probably should be on this slide. Um, biocontrol efforts are the first thing that come to mind. Um, so we'll, those will all be part of our ongoing efforts to, uh, to plan and anticipate for spotted lanternfly. I think this is my last slide. Yeah, I, I'd just like to end with a comment about um, 
those of you on the phone and those of you who may think you could play a role in our spot -a lanternfly effort, I encourage you to get in touch with us. We can send you materials. We can help you with ideas for training. Um, and uh, I, I put a note on the slide because Emma made this presentation and I, I took the whole thing from her. So thanks again. And I'm happy to take any questions 